Danny, this is Bob Lazzari, Tony D'Angelo here in Eastern Connecticut. We're honored to welcome you to Monday Night Sports Talk. Good evening, Danny. Thanks, guys. How are you? We're very good. And again, I want to uh, I want to just commend you on your cooperation, Danny, and, and your uh, willingness to appear on the show. Uh, first of all, uh, we've talked about the 68 Tigers before on the show because we've had Gates Brown on the show. And I have to tell you also that my father was a very big fan of yours. I lost my dad last year, Denny, but he, uh, after that 68 season, everything was compared to Denny McLean. A guy would win 23, 24 games, and he would always say, not like McLean in 68. So uh, it was... Uh, God bless him. That was an honor. Yeah, he was a big fan, I, I have to tell you, and uh, really enjoyed watching your pitch, and I thank you for that. But, thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Just some background on Denny in general uh, for our folks in the audience, born uh, in the Chicago area, signed by the White Sox as an amateur free agent in 1962, debuted with the Tigers uh, at the age of 19, Tony, in 1963. Uh, my, my first, uh, of course, Denny, uh, three-time All-Star Tony, we'll get to the two-time Cy Young Award winner, an MVP in 1968. Uh, but my first question, Denny, uh, back in 60, well, early, early 60s, here you are in the White Sox system. You're a Chicago boy, but uh, since you weren't promoted to the majors, you, you get picked up off of waivers by Detroit. Was that in any way a disappointment to you at the time, Denny, to leave, like, your home area? Well, uh, it wasn't so much that as it, it, as it was what uh, the, the manager of the ball club said to me. We had... We had just come from, we had flown over to Mexico City to have a, a three or four game exhibition with uh, the Mexico City team, uh, whatever they were called at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, all, all the pitchers were going to pitch over the four days. So, you know, we all got our opportunities. And then Saturday night, I got my opportunity and uh, faced nine and got all nine out. I think I struck out five or six. Mm -hmm. And uh, then on the plane going home, uh, remember, I'm only 19, or just getting, in fact, I'm still 18 when, when all this went down because uh, my birthday wasn't until March 29th, which would have made me then 19. And um, uh, so here I am, an 18-year-old from Chicago, and I'm sitting there in a row of seats by myself. It's a charter, of course. I'll never forget, it was a stretch eight. And uh, Al Lopez, who was the manager of the club, came down and sat right next to me. He says, hey, can I talk to you a minute? And I said, yeah, talk to you a minute. And I said, you're the boss. <laughs> so uh, he said, uh, I was really impressed with the way you threw the ball. He says, you've got as much velocity as I've ever seen. And he says, but I don't think you'll ever be a big league pitcher. And I thought he was pulling my leg. And I, and I kind of chuckled. And I said, why do you say that? He says, well, I, you don't have a breaking ball. You don't have a curveball. You don't have an off-speed pitch. You don't have a slider. Uh, you don't have some of the, another pitch to go along with your fastball as good as it is. I said, well, I said, I, I, you know, I said one thing my dad always told me before he died was, don't throw a curveball and don't throw a uh, slider because somebody will come along if you're that good and teach you how to throw those pitches. And I said, Mr. Lopez, that's what I was hoping the organization would do is teach me how to throw these pitches that I'm going to need. And he says, well, I just don't think so. He said, but let me tell you what we're going to do. And he says, you know what my opinion is already. I just don't think you'll ever be a big league pitcher because you don't have a breaking ball. I said, okay. I said, what are you going to do, sir? And he said, well, what we're going to do, there was another pitcher. Well, there were two other pitchers. One was Dave DeBusher. <laughs> of course, I think most of you folks will remember DeBusher. Sure, sure. And uh, David, of course, being from Detroit and what have you, David uh, uh, was the big bonus baby at the time. He got sixty or $70,000 to sign and play with the White Sox. So you, you knew they weren't getting rid of them. They could only protect two out of three guys who were on the Major League roster. It was a Major League roster issue is what the problem was. And they, they were trying to protect all three of us, so they put all three of us on the roster, but the rules only allowed you to keep two. So what Al DeRocher and his divine wisdom said was, I'm going to pitch you and Bruce Howard. Bruce Howard was the other guy, and he had pitched uh, in college for a couple, two, three years. Yeah, a good pitcher, good guy, too. And uh, Bruce and I were to pitch against each other the following Saturday at 11 a.m. in the morning, and whoever lost that game was going to be put on waivers, and the first club that grabbed us, of course, we would belong to them. Uh, lo and behold, I gave up a home run in the first inning. I got beat one to nothing. I was immediately put on waivers. In fact, I struck out 13 or 14 guys, too. 
And uh, so what? <laughs> uh, I was immediately put on waivers, and Detroit picked me up. And within two hours, Detroit had driven down from Lakeland, Florida, where Tiger Town is, grabbed me, put me in the car. He says, "Come on, we just don't want him to make a mistake. Get in the car. We're getting the hell out of here." Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, two or three hours later, I was in Tiger Town in Lakeland, Florida, and as they say, the rest is history. The rest is. <laughs> and, and Danny, here you make your major league debut, ironically, at the age of nineteen against the White Sox. Against That's exactly Chicago. Right. But here. But here's the best part. My first official bat uh, at bat in the major leagues was a home run. And that's the only one you ever hit, correct? That's the only one I ever hit. I only hit one other extra base hit. Uh, I hit a triple in, in my 29th win in 68. I don't know how the hell that happened. <laughs> but uh, uh, the bottom line was um, it was the greatest thing to happen to me. Um, and, uh, you know, life got very good for a very long time. It sure did, and, and, and he moves on to, to – he pitches a bit in 64. He gets uh, 16 starts, and then in 65, it really starts rolling, Tony. I mean, he, he, he uh, then he sets a major league record at the time for striking out the first seven hitters he faced in relief in a game uh, that he relieved Dave Wickersham. He's 16 and 6 and the 29 starts. That had to be the year, Denny, you said to yourself, hey, I'm going to be one of the best pitchers in the league, and you're probably looking back and thinking, Al Lopez, take this. <laughs> well, you know, it, it certainly was a day that I pitched against him. Of course, we won the ball game 4-3. to three. I pitched 9 that day. And um, the bottom line was it wasn't me against the White Sox. It was me against Al Lopez right. because I had something to prove that in my first major league start, of course. I mean, you could have asked for a better script. I mean, here, here you were told you'll never be a big league pitcher. You get off the plane and you're wondering what the hell happens after next Saturday. The next thing you know, uh, you know, six months later on a Saturday afternoon, you're pitching against this guy who's supposed to be the greatest manager of all time mm -hmm. in baseball, and lo and behold, you beat him four to three. I mean, it, it, you talk about coming full circle. That was it. Well, then the bad thing happened in '64. Uh, I hurt myself in spring training. My uh, something in my back under my shoulder blade, and it took him. I don't know, two or three months to get the thing uh, finally uh, taken care of. But, boy, for three months, I wasn't sure if I was going to pitch ever again. And then I got my break in 65 when uh, Wickersham was getting his head pounded out. And, uh, as, again, as they say, then history was uh, reborn for Denny McLean that night. That's for sure. And we'll go through some of the numbers, which are staggering in the next few years. But uh, as we talk to Denny, we'll be showing a uh, collage of pictures. We have various pictures of him. Uh, at different times of his career. We'll keep showing them on the TV screen while we talk. Uh, again, we're on the phone with the great Denny McLean. Tony, question. And Denny, I, I can't tell you what a, what a pleasure this is. I, I watched you as a child. I read about you in the sporting news. I, I followed you very closely. And there's a story which has always fascinated me. And I wanted to ask you if this was true. Did you really drink that much Pepsi? Yeah, I still do. As a matter of fact, uh, I was with uh, I was with Pepsi for 25 years. Uh, I was lucky. I you know my one of my best friends was the VP of Pepsi Cola Michigan, and he hired me uh, just to do a year or two, and I wound up being 25. And then uh, at the same time, as you may or may not know, I'm a keyboard player. I've got a, a degree in music. Absolutely. And um, I watched behold, you in the uh, I wound show. up with the Hammond Company for many, many, many years, and of course, did a lot of nightclub work, had a great time. And, uh, you know, so th those two things, because our salaries certainly weren't very much back then. Mm -hmm. uh, the year I won 30, I was only making $30,000. And uh, it's, hard, it's right? hard to believe. It's hard to believe where the game has gone money-wise. I mean, I would I just like to have one year of, of Justin Verlander money right now. That'd, be, that'd make the whole rest of your life, wouldn't it? Well, they, they really couldn't would. pay you right now with the, with the kind of numbers you put up. And, and uh, it, it's staggering, Denny. I looked. From 66 to 69, I'm throwing these numbers out to Tony earlier in the day. You made 157 starts in that uh, in that couple year stretch. There, two 21 seasons, of course, the 31 games win season in 68, which I still can't fathom. I, I started fo really following baseball in 68. Um, but my question about that year, 68, Denny, in say in spring training that year, did you have any inkling? I don't think you had any inkling you could win 30 games, but did you have any inkling that could it be a very, very good season for both yourself well, and the you know, team? I, I was uh, I, I had pitched well, 65 and 116, 17 and 66. Yeah. 
Um, and then 67, I won, or 66, I won 20. Yep. And then 67, I won 17. So I knew I could pitch in the big leagues. I mean, I think that question had been answered. Sure. And uh, But the thing about it was I still was trying to develop another pitch, a good curveball or a slider. And uh, I was having a lot of trouble with it. And then lo and behold, they went out and hired Johnny Sane. Mm-hmm. And uh, Johnny Sane and I uh, spent many, many, many hours, and he and Hal Narragon, down in the bullpen trying to get me to, to uh, develop a hard slider and a little bit of a swerve, as they call it, a, a, a breaking ball that you can throw on any count. And, the, and, the, and that particular breaking ball was used to throw when you were behind the, when you were behind the hitter. Because uh, when you were ahead of the hitter, we had the same – uh, common theory about pitching. You get a guy 0-2, 1-2, and and you go get him. You don't screw around. Mm-hmm. You don't throw him change-ups. You don't throw him. You just go get him. I mean, that's what's wrong with the game today. I mean, uh, there's two things that, that I don't understand. When you get a guy 0-2, Jesus, go strike him out or go throw a, a strike. You don't have to nip to make the count 3-2. and two. And then today in, in the St. Louis-Washington uh, game, I don't know what's happened to fundamentals. There was a real high fly ball hit to right center field today, and and the entire time the ball was in the air, the center fielder was screaming for it. My ball, I got it, I got it, I got it. And here comes the right fielder saying, I got it, and made the play. Wow. I mean, what people, I'm sure most of your listeners know, whenever the center fielder says he's got it, it's his ball. He takes it, sure. That's it. There's no, there's no argument. And I've never seen so many guys in left field and center field, even with our Detroit team. I mean, and we got a hell of a kid playing center field for us, this kid Jackson. Mm-hmm. And uh, But even with him out there, they, they still go get balls that he's called for. And I just don't know where the fundamentals I blame that partially on management. I blame it on Jimmy Leland, who's a dear friend of mine. Mm-hmm. And he and I talk about it from time to time. But, you know, I, I, the game has changed so dramatically uh, you know, no longer do you have to pitch nine innings. You've got to pitch five innings. They call it a great start if you go five <laughs> innings. Uh, you know, I, I, it's like I told um, trying to think of Dean Chance. Dean Chance is a dear friend of mine. And I told Dean, I said, listen, if you, and I, you, if you and I only had to pitch five innings when we were playing, to hell, we'd still be pitching. <laughs> You know, and we talked uh, when we All talked. The time. We talked to Gates Brown uh, and about the, that whole era, Denny, and he was actually chuckling like Tony and I are because we'd mentioned uh, quality starts or pitch counts, and he, he says, "Couldn't understand." You got to understand. I play with Mickey Lowish, Denny McLean. He says, "You're going to come out and take the ball from them guys." You know the no, way he said it happen. was so uh, funny. And you know, speaking of Gates Brown. How would he like to hit against his pitching that's in the big leagues today? Oh. Yeah, I mean, we, listen, down, we, had, we, had, we didn't have the greatest hitters of all time, but our guys knew how to play the game. We had, well, K-Line certainly is one of the great hitters of all time, but we had Willie Horton, we had Gates Brown, we had Jimmy Northup, who was one hell of a clutch hitter, yeah. Mickey, Stanley. Mickey Stanley. Now, I want to yeah. tell you something. If those four or five guys that I just named were playing against today's pitching, they would all be 320 hitters. I'm telling you, that's how good they were. Yeah. You know, the big difference back in the 60s, 50s, and early 70s is we had fewer teams, so the talent was so much deeper. Yeah. And when you've got these 32 teams with half of the pitching staffs are AAA, in some cases less, you're going to have a lot of guys hit a lot of home runs. And, I, you know, I, this is going to go on for a long time. I don't. There's only one way to ch- – there's two ways to change the game. Number one. Raise the mound. Put the mound back where it belongs, Mm -hmm. uh, at 16 inches. And then number two, let's reduce the let's have the strike zone where it once was, under the armpits, down to the top of the knees. Give us that strike zone back. There's a couple things that will happen by raising the mound. You're going to have fewer pitchers get hurt. You're not going to have the big strain on the shoulder and the elbow that you have with a higher mound. And of course, with the strike zone, a bigger, a little bigger strike zone, the guys aren't going to throw that many more pitches, and they're not going to throw as many as they're throwing today, and the games will be shorter. What the hell is wrong with a game uh, under two and a half hours? Well, <laughs> we say that all the time. We've said it before. We mm-hmm. we remember the games watching Tom Seaver one fifty eight. You know, yeah, like sure. an hour fifty eight or whatever here in New York. As uh, Gary Giolle would say, keep the motor running. Exactly. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll inject this. We're in the process of uh, editing a, a, a book of ours, which will be out uh, in uh, sometime November, we, mo- mo- November, December, and it's called 31 and 6. No one's ever sat down and done a book on the 31 and 6 season, nobody. 
And um, what we do is we take every game, we talk about the highlights, who hit the home run, who hit the double, who made the play, who made the defensive play of the game. And we talk about these guys that people have totally forgotten about, the Bill Freehands and the Norm Cashes, the Ray Oilers and guys like that. And uh, what's amazing about it is how many games that we played that were under two hours and ten minutes, two hours and 15 minutes. It's amazing because... We didn't walk a lot of guys. No. I mean, we just went after the hitters. And, um, you know, it's amazing how the game has changed. It's so dramatically different now. And uh, on one hand, I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed a lot because I like, I like touchdowns to be scored in all these games. Yeah. And then the other thing is that you very seldom see the game completed before the sixth or seventh inning. In other words, no matter what the score is, the first five or six innings, it can be five to nothing, seven to two, ten to nine, ten to eight. Mm-hmm. You, the ball game is still in front of them, seventh, eighth, and ninth innings. There's more action every game in the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning than there is the first six innings, almost every ball game, um, which gives the fans a little bit more to watch and, and uh, be excited about. But it's, I'll say one thing about the game. It's, it's never been more exciting than it is right now. That's true, and I believe with the uh, the new playoff uh, format, Denny, it gave uh, teams that probably wouldn't have had a chance, at least uh, some hope, even 10 days with the season uh, left, there was still hope for Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there's three teams that are experiencing something right now. Oakland, um, Washington, and um, let's see, which, which one am I missing? Um, Washington. Those three teams are finding out what it means to have experienced players on their team. I mean, Oakland hasn't got a chance. I mean, honestly, they, have, they didn't have a chance when it, when it started. Errors or no errors, and, and inexperienced players will make errors, as they certainly have in two games in a row. Mm-hmm. Uh, Washington looks like, uh, you know, they've got a couple of experienced guys, but they don't have enough guys. Yeah. Um, and uh, then you've got, um, um, who's, who's the other one I'm Baltimore? thinking of? Baltimore is the other one I was thinking of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They don't have any experience in any kind of pressure situation. They had a hell of a year, mm-hmm. but those three teams, they can't beat anybody. Yeah. I mean, it's, I still think the World Series this year is going to come down to the same way again. It's going to be St. Louis and Detroit. I really believe that. I mean, St. Louis, I was uh, I watched about four or five innings of the game today. I was impressed. I wasn't impressed when I saw them yesterday, but they got a better team than even I thought. Yeah, Matheny as a first, uh, the whole yeah. transition from Lewis, uh, he's, he's done a hell of a job, but uh, you're right. Again, folks, we're on the phone with the legendary Denny McLean. Tony, question. And Denny, I'll tell you, I watched you, um, I was very young, I watched you in that 68 year, I watched you win your 31st game. I've never seen a pitcher have the command that you had that year, but uh, in talking about the 68 season, I had the transistor radio on my bed. Um, I was a Yankee fan, and uh, I was wondering when Mickey was going to hit his 535th home run, and uh, we found you on the mound. I've heard stories about this. Can you tell us, in your own words, exactly what happened? No, it's in the book, though. (laughs) You can buy it on Kindle. Okay. (laughs) Let me just put this this to bed. Okay. Mickey Mantle was my idol growing up on the south side of Chicago. Yes. Uh, don't tough to figure that one out, but I grew up being a Chicago Cub fan, uh, and everybody's idol when I was growing up was Mickey Mantle. Everybody wanted to hit from the left and the right side. Everybody wanted to wear number seven. Everybody wanted to play center field. And the great thing about Mickey, of course, he had just always seemed to be a good, good, super guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I only wish, I only wish that I had, and I had hundreds, if not thousands, of Mickey Mantle rookie cards. Mm -hmm. And I put them in my bike, as we all did back then, in our spokes, in our bikes, so you could hear us coming. So I probably lost, on those Mickey Mantle cards, probably $22 million (laughs) worth of Mickey Mantle cards, rookie cards. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And then my mother found some, uh, oh, geez, about 20 years ago, and called me, and by mistake, uh, my dad has been dead a long time, so her husband, by mistake, uh, she had seven or eight rookie cards she had found, and he threw them in the garbage can. 
Uh, there's another story that is, to some of us, it makes us cringe, and but yeah. we've all been there, Denny. I mean, I had the, the you know, mom went through the, uh, one day did some major I cleaning. I a couple left. <laughs> bye bye thousands, you know. That's how it works. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But, uh, you know, i tell you how good that 68 team, you know, I just found this yeah. out today. Denny was the MVP, Tony. You know who's number two in the MVP voting was Bill Freehand, his catch. Oh, yeah. So, Bill was uh, a great player. I'm sure you give him a lot of credit yeah. for your success, uh, but the numbers are staggering. 68 and 69, Tony, get this. Denny made 82 starts, 661 innings. This is two years, folks. 51 complete games. Now, looking back, Denny, probably at the time you didn't have any concerns about your workload. It was just a different society back then. But now, looking back, it probably did take a toll on your arm. Well, yeah, I started developing arm problems uh, about, uh, actually it was two years before 68, sometime in late 66. Mm. I hurt my arm one afternoon in an extra inning game in, in Minnesota. And uh, although it wasn't dramatically bad, um, I got a shot of cortisone, got my first shot of cortisone in late 66, and I felt great. Uh, mm. Came back in 67, had some problems, and then I hurt my foot in September. Um, so I got, I got a rest by not having to really pitch in the month of September, so, and we didn't go anywhere that year. We, we finished second and half a game out the last game of the season. And um, so um, despite winning 17, I really – I had a couple of arm issues, but and it was always the same one in my shoulder, my, my rotator cuff. But, you know, they kept shooting me with cortisone and cortisone and cortisone. In fact, in 68, I had uh, – I think it was 18 or 19 cortisone shots. And then in uh, 69, I had 24 or 25. Oh, dear. Uh, so this thing never stopped hurting, and it just got worse and worse and worse. Um, and, uh, you know, back then, they tried to convince us, and did a hell of a job, by the way, that the cortisone was a cure-all drug. It wouldn't hurt you. Oh. It could only help you. Uh -huh. And really all cortisone did and still does is it removes some inflammation if you hit the right spot. If you don't hit the right spot, it does nothing for you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, we worked at Ford Hospital. They were pretty good at doing what they did. But uh, the bottom line was you all it did was get rid of the inflammation. It did not heal anything. And, and how could you heal anything? How could you heal an injury if we're still going out and pitching every fourth day? Yeah. That's, uh, you know, you know that was the thing, and um, yeah. uh, what people don't realize, cortisone or no cortisone, we were supposed to win one for the Gipper and never miss a turn, because if you missed a couple of turns, you were going right back to Toledo. There you go, and it was a, a different, and the complete games show that in the, the innings and everything, and again, it was a totally different era. He was talking about 67, he, he still pitched 235 innings, Tony, yes. uh, with the sore arm. Sore. But, but now guys get to 170, 180, uh, Denny, they're shutting him down. It's crazy. But Oh, it's... this thing in Washington is pathetic. I, I, um, and I know he can't do anything about it. I'm sure he would rather be pitching than not. In mm -hmm. fact, if he was pitching, I would make them, I would say clearly that they would be in the World Series. But if he's not pitching, which he isn't, then they, they've got no shot. But yeah. um, the thing that's so wrong about that is the fans have come to the stadium all year long to watch him pitch. He's pitched well. He did his thing again. I mean, the kid's a legitimate superstar. If he's not a superstar, he's closer than a, a, you know, a, a head on a pin. Right. And uh, the bottom line is he's great for the game. The difference between him and our Verlander, by the way, is dramatic in the sense that they both throw probably velocity-wise about the same thing. Mm -hmm. But the fastball with um, uh, Strasburg explodes about seven or eight feet in front of home plate. Mm -hmm. Verlander is just an overpowering fastball. Yeah. Verlander's ball will move a little bit, but this ball, this fastball that Strasburg throws is just a monster exploding in front of the plate. Mm. Um, and that's when you really got yourself somebody really special. But here's my question for everybody, and I'm so tired of, of this story and him not pitching. Mm -hmm. Last year when he got hurt, you mean the geniuses in Washington didn't know he was going to get hurt last year? They think he's going to get hurt this year? <laughs> what happened last year? Uh, um, you know, that's, that's what I don't understand. He got hurt. He got it repaired. He's pitched like Cy Young, for God's sakes, almost mm -hmm. every time he went out there. Let him pitch. And, and here's the other point here. The bottom line is you'll never know when you're going to get another chance to be there. And it's, right. it's horrible to be punishing 
that entire baseball team and the organization sure. because you think it's in the best interest of the ball club to protect this kid. If you really want to protect him, just pay him for the next 20 years and don't make him pitch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so true. And uh, you're pitching from May 1st on or something. Yeah. Grew up no yeah. Well, if you're, but if you're, if you're going to do that, then you're not a member of the team. No, you're not. You know, I mean, come on. If you're going to be a yeah. player, be a player. If you're going to, and I know it's not his decision. If you want him to be a wuss, then let him go someplace where he'd be more appreciated. Because I just, I, I know they love him, and I know he puts people in the stands. But the bottom line is, he'll put more people in the stands if, in fact, he's allowed to pitch in a regular rotation. Exactly, Denny. Protecting the investment, but then again, they may not get mm -hmm. this far for a while, so it kind of balances out. It, and let me ask you a question: uh, uh, protecting inve the investment. Right. I understand that. We all understand that. But what investment are they protecting now with his with his ass on the on the bench? True. There you mm -hmm. go. It makes. You know, you don't need any. Just send him home. He doesn't have to be protected now. No. Yeah. So, I couldn't say it any better. Again, we're on the phone, folks. Denny McLean, we still have a few more minutes. Again, we're showing pictures on the screen of Denny, different points of his career. Tony, question. And, and Denny, you know, when um, you wound your way out of Detroit and uh, found yourself uh, at one point in Washington. No, it was horrible. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, Ted Williams, who... I'm sorry. I mean, I don't want to talk about the dead in a very disparaging way, but Ted just was a bad manager. He was, mm -hmm. a, he was a bad guy. Uh, let me get back to Freehand for one second sure. before I talk about Ted. Sure. Bill Freehand was an all-star 10, 11, or 12 times, yeah. and he can't get a vote to get into the Hall of Fame. Does right. it make sense? No. He's a great catcher. And no. now he's got all. Now he's got third degree Alzheimer's. Uh, it's, oh. it's, it, it's a sad commentary of what can happen to one of the most trim and fit athletes ever yeah. in the history of the game. Anyway, getting back to Ted. Yeah. Uh, Teddy just did not want to uh, be there. To be honest with him, the only reason, and I want people to understand this, the only reason Ted came back is because he lost his contract with Sears. Yeah. Now, yeah. when he lost his contract with Sears, that cut out, they say, about a half a million dollars of income per year because he, he had a salary and a base and a commission he structure, which was supposed to yeah. be incredible. Mm -hmm. So um, Bob Short, who owned the Washington Senators, called him and said, listen, Ted, my name is Bob Short. Let's do the whole thing. I, he says, I think you can get your Sears contract back if you come manage my baseball team in Washington. And you know what Ted told him. We can't use that language on this radio show. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Ted thought he was some kook coming out of the garbage can. Uh, for quite some time. So they finally got their acts together, the, the two of them, and lo and behold, uh, Teddy goes back to, uh, he's going to manage now for the Washington Senators, and within a week of signing the contract with the Washington Senators, he signed the contract with Sears again. And, of course, uh, uh, even when he died, he was still under contract. Mm. But uh, So that's the only reason he came back. He needed the game like a hole in the head if it wasn't for Sears. Yeah. Well, he isn't. It's a typical situation, and we talked before the show, guys that are probably were managing or coaching in different sports that probably shouldn't have. Tony, they were there for their name. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a difference for between money. being a superstar on the field and trying to guide other superstars. But, uh, yeah, that, that just didn't work out. And But, Denny, that year for Washington, uh, again, 10-22, and 22, but... You know, you've pitched 216 innings. Your ERA was, just, ERA was just over four, Denny. Did you have any inkling? I mean, those aren't that bad of numbers, but you'd be out, you'd be out of baseball by the end of the following year. Did you have an inkling at that time? Well, still between, between the arm, between the mound being lowered, mm -hmm. uh, and just to tell you how dramatic lowering the mound was, in 1968 I struck out, I think, 280 guys. Mm -hmm. In 1969 I only struck out 180. That's after they lowered the mound six inches. Mm -hmm. That tells you what they did to the pitchers. Wow. And most of the top pitchers, the top 25 pitchers, before 1975, all had serious injuries or were out of the game. That's how dramatic lowering the mound was because they wanted touchdowns and no longer did they want shutouts. Yeah. Uh, and what happened with Ted in Washington was I knew I, I knew I was getting near the end. I mean, I told him that when, when we had our first press conference together. And uh, I said, I don't know how many years I can do this. He said, just give me one or two. We need to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know what they meant by that, go somewhere. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they, they wound up going to Texas. Yeah. And uh, 
Ted said, um, you pitch as much as you can and do much as you can. And I will say this, if we had such a bad relationship, if I wasn't on the disabled list for around 21 to 25 days that year, Ted would have seen to it that I would have lost 30 in 1971. I'm telling you, that's how bad the relationship was. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, it was, uh, it was no fun. Never in my life did I ever think that I didn't want to go to the ballpark. And after the first month of the season, and it had nothing to do with the guys on the team. They were all terrific people. Mm-hmm. But it had to do with Ted. He made everything so uncomfortable. Oh, and then he had a, a, for the lack of a better term, a rat running around in the clubhouse uh, that only reported to him. In fact, I won't even it wasn't a player. It was a coach. Mm-hmm. And uh, their job, his job was totally to report every day what he heard in the clubhouse. Yeah. So, you know, it, it was just uh, – it was a very bad environment for everybody. And he played with some well-known guys such as Frank Howard, Tony, uh, Toby Hara, Don Mincher, Del Unser, yeah. guys uh, that we were familiar with back in the day. But uh, yeah. it was a tough way to, at least toward the, the end of Denny's career, career, way yeah. tough way to go out. Question? No? Yeah, you know, as uh, Denny, as far as um, we, we appreciate you here as, as a ball player, but we know you've done – radio you've talked about a lot of civic things and political things and you know if we're going to have an elephant in the living room question here we have a major election right now in this country we have a lot of issues um sports seems to be uh, changing by the moment not for the better you know g- give us some thoughts on you know any one of those subjects well i'm a big obama guy to be honest with you and um i just don't think that um He's ever been given the credit that he deserved uh, when he first came on the scene. I mean, who, how many people could have handled it as well as he did? Um, how many people would have stepped in there and not been overwhelmed by it? I, and I even think his, he and his people were. I mean, to, see, I think if that happens in the middle of Bush's term, then they, got, they get a handle on it over the next three or four years, and it wouldn't have been half as bad. But because it happened when it happened, the end of, uh, you know, the end of 2007 and 2008, it couldn't have been more serious. And, and let me say one thing. We in Detroit, we love the guy because what he did for the automobile industry. Folks, mm-hmm. if those automobile companies had shut down, this country was decimated. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about 20,000 jobs. We're not talking about 100,000. We're not talking about 300,000 or a million. We're talking about millions and millions of jobs that depend on the auto industry for things such as a 7-Eleven store being open, a bar being open on the corner near a plant, uh, gasoline and lube jobs and things like that. We're talking about millions and millions of jobs that he saved when he did whatever he did. Uh, You know, and listen, uh, I don't know if he's going to win, but uh, I know know he's winning a lot of states. They say that he wasn't supposed to win. And I can only hope for the best. Uh, Romney, of course, has spent a lot of time in Michigan. Right. And uh, I knew his dad real well. His dad was some gentleman. Uh, and, uh, and he was not a greedy guy. He wasn't selfish. He cared about people. And he was a Republican. What an upset, huh? <laughs> and uh, the bottom line was uh, Mitt is not the same guy as his dad. And I think um, when you start talking about the 47% that he doesn't care about, and now, of course, he's flip-flopped that statement. Now he cares about everybody again. <laughs> uh, I think that tell, says more than anything else. When you, don't, when you don't care about 47% of the country, what do you really care about? Yeah, it's a problem uh, with uh, not only in presidential elections, Tony. Well, you know, and, and Denny's right in the middle of it. It's Detroit. It's the auto yeah. industry. It's baseball. It's it's all yeah, there. It's all there, <laughs> right? But uh, I know, Denny, you uh, you wrote a book, uh, I think, about five years ago uh, entitled I Told You I Wasn't Perfect. Uh, you had some problems off the field in your post-playing days, but I, I'm sure when after writing that book, and, and, and I know probably way before then, uh, you, it was b- very therapeutic for you to talk about some of your past indiscretions. And, of course, none of us are perfect. And uh, I, I know you're uh, up to some great things these days. Well, I wrote, to be honest with you, the biggest reason we wrote the book was because I lost my daughter. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I lost my daughter, Kristen. Um, she was 26 years old, and a drunken, tr- a drunken truck driver killed her mm-hmm. um, with an 18-wheeler. And... Um, the book became therapeutic because of her. 
uh, I got uh, for years. It it was I was a mess. Um, mm-hmm. I, I was on radio and TV, of course, when she died. Right. And uh, within a couple of years, within within a year or two, I, I had resigned from radio, resigned from TV. I was making seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. Nobody walks away from that kind of money. Not after you played the game I played. Right. And uh, I went a little nuts, to be honest with you. I, I lost all sense of reality for a number of years. Not that I was deliriously delusional. I just couldn't concentrate. And um, it wasn't fair to the radio or TV station, and, and I walked away from all of it. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to go back on radio and TV again here in Detroit. I'm, I've been offered uh, mm-hmm. uh, a couple of positions here now, and I guess I'll be back on the air within the next couple of weeks. Fantastic. Thank goodness. Good. Give me something to do. <laughs> and, you know, uh, and, Denny, I, I talked to a friend of mine today who lives in Sterling Heights, Michigan, and her mother never was a TV watcher. She lost her mother maybe 10 years ago, but never watched soap operas, anything, but actually listened to radio out there and said she always enjoyed your show. It, you. it, it was always uh, interesting, a little controversial, but she loved listening to you. So uh, that was from a girl from Well, you Sterling tell her Heights. we said thank you, because what we tried to do with the show all the time mm-hmm. was, uh, I think, all radio and all politics are local. I really believe that. Mm-hmm. And as long as you can stay localized with your radio show, I think most people would do ra- would rather well. Rather than trying to do you know, uh, murders in Texas and Arizona and every other place. Worry about what's happening in your town. People want to know what's going on in your city, uh, where they live. And if you can give them enough information, you'll have listeners forever. And I think Tony and I agree uh, as we wrap this thing up. Uh, the last two pitchers, Tony, to come even close to 30 wins were Steve Carlton in 72 and Bob Welch in 90, who both won 27. I think a 30-win season is is something that is impossible at this Not point, Danny, just because game. of the way the number of starts, the way pitchers are taking out of games, and I'm sure you probably feel the same. Well, I do. Uh, nobody's going to get the number of starts that I got. Uh, I got 41 starts that year, although getting in the high 30s, low 40s starts every year wasn't a big thing in the big leagues back then. Uh, a lot of guys got uh, in the upper 30s, 40 starts. Uh, but the bottom line is you got to go out there every fourth day. And, I mean, if you don't get a chance, and, and this is the one thing you got to be, uh, you got to be consistent. you got to throw strikes. And more importantly than anything else that happens to you winning 30 ball games, you got to be playing with one hell of a baseball team. And, you and I played with the likes, as I said earlier, K-Line, Cash, Gates Brown, Willie Horton, uh, Mickey Stanley, Jimmy Northup. I played with the best of the best. And, and I don't say that they were the greatest superstars, but I will tell you this. Nobody played the game better than they did for three or four years. Right. They never missed a cutoff, man. They never missed a hit and run. They never missed a run and hit. They never missed a bunt. I mean, they were impeccable when it came to the fundamentals. And that's the thing, as I said earlier today, I don't know what's happened to the game with fundamentals. Nobody practices them anymore at all. Well. Culminated, Tony, in a 68 World Championship for those Tigers, and we've talked at length with Gates Brown and about and that in the amazing, honor of speaking with Danny. About yeah, the same but time. Uh, Danny, I mean, uh, our time is just about up here. I can't thank you enough. It's been an honor. We've and been really honored. Maybe we'll have a chance to uh, talk to you again next year uh, when you're uh, involved in radio again, and we'd love to even continue. There's probably half the questions we haven't gotten to tonight, but uh, it's been an awful pleasure. You've been uh, a co- topic of conversation to me and Tony, and of course, I told you about my dad for many, many years. Right, and, uh, you tell him I said hi. I will uh, again. We'll uh, we'll get try to get you back on, uh, and please keep in touch in the meantime. And uh, our best right, to uh, your family. Guys, thank too. you very much. I've enjoyed it. Have a great great uh, evening, and uh, I guess we're pulling for the Yankees, right? <laughs> some of us. <laughs> some no, of us. You know. All right, some of us are. Then all right, you guys have a great evening. Take care, Danny. Good night, Danny.